If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Greetings and welcome once again to Pilgrim Publications Presents. I'm Larry Wessels and I want to thank you for being here with us today. We have a very special show, I think, one that will be of great interest to uh, many Bible students out there and people that are interested in church history and church doctrine. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to introduce my co-host on this program, Bob L. Ross, director of Pilgrim Publications. Well, we're certainly glad to have this opportunity to speak to the people that are watching via television on this particular program especially concerning the uh, ministry and life and work and influence of C.H. Spurgeon. Now, C.H. Spurgeon, uh, many people are uh, no doubt out there that are seeing us right now uh, would go, C.H. who? How do you spell that? You know, <laughs> what, what is that? Uh, and I think well, we're going to try to shed a little light on that and let people know who C.H. Spurgeon was. Uh, as a matter of fact, brother, uh, just to get into this subject, uh, we have a few books here on our, uh, our set easel. Uh, maybe you'd like to explain something about these books and we'll move right into the topic of Well, we mounted these up here, Larry, just for the sake of illustrating to the viewers <clears throat> some of the things that we have produced from Spurgeon. This is one volume out of his 63-volume sermon set. 63 volumes? Called the New Park Street Pulpit and Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit, which covers the years of his preaching from uh, 1855 to 1892 plus the materials that uh, were published after he died, which had not been printed during his lifetime. They took these stenographically, and of course, publishing them once a week, they did not print all of them during the lifetime of Spurgeon, but they had sufficient amount left to publish for 25 years with a weekly sermon, and each volume uh, amounts to one year of weekly publications. And then we have uh, printed a lot of the materials out of his magazine, which is called the Sword and the Trowel magazine. Sword and the Trowel. And uh, we uh, got this volume together, Sermons on Sovereignty by Spurgeon, which deals with various things that would be theologically comprehended under the theme of sovereign grace, uh, soteriology, and then the commentary on Matthew, which was finished, uh, well, hardly finished, just before Spurgeon died. And then some of his friends, along with his wife, they finished the commentary from comments he'd made on these particular verses in the last chapter of Matthew in his sermon. Are you talking, this book here then would be around 1892. Right. Uh, somewhere in the latter part of his life, W.Y. Fullerton, who was one of his students and friends and fellow ministers, uh, he and Mrs. Spurgeon, I think, 
did the latter part of this from Spurgeon's sermons that uh, he had spoken or commented on those uh, verses, but mm -hmm. he uh, had worked on this for a while. And then uh, I have the pictorial biography of C.H. Spurgeon, which is a book I put together mainly depending upon the autobiography of Spurgeon, which was put together by his wife and private secretary, Mr. J.W. Harrell. And uh, we've gone through several editions of this book. And uh, it gives a concise, uh, interesting, I hope, approach to the life of Spurgeon, utilizing a lot of the pictures that are also in the original four-volume autobiography. And, and then we have, uh, I'm rushing through some of this hurriedly because we have so much. We have the February 1991 edition. This is actually the quarter for, it's issue number 29 of Christian History. This is a well-known Christian magazine published uh, by the same people who publish Christianity Today magazine. And this whole issue was devoted to uh, the life and ministry of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And there are many interesting articles, photographs, anecdotes, and so forth in here about Spurgeon. And this is available from us. We bought several thousand copies of this mm -hmm. to uh, make available to those with whom we have contact. So these are some samples of some of the materials that we have published by Spurgeon. Our primary interest is his sermon set, which contains over 3,500 sermons mm -hmm. and uh, a massive set of books, to say the least. And uh, so do you have any focus on Spurgeon while we got a little time here? Well, I was just uh, curious. You, you've mentioned the 66 volumes of this. 63. 63. 63 <coughs> volumes of Spurgeon's Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit, uh, uh, all these other sermons he, he, he's, he has. How many uh, different titles does Pilgrim Publications have uh, just under different covers well, of, uh, of Spurgeon's works? Um, I have uh, had that question asked, and I should have a ready answer. We uh, have the 63 sermon books, and then we have about... Uh, that, that magazine there, Sword and Trial, we have over a half dozen of those. I, I would say we're running well over a hundred titles just with what we have. Now, some of it is kind of repetitious in a sense because like we have some little booklets here, Exposition of the Doctrines of Grace. This came out of the Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit. We have uh, well over 50 individual sermons published in little booklets like this, mm -hmm. The Old, Old Story, Sonship Question, His Name, The Everlasting Father, The Unchangeable Christ, and uh, one hiding behind there, The Cross, Our Glory. We have well over 50 individual titles. Then we have some booklets like this that have uh, two or three sermons. Here's one on imputed righteousness. And we have small books. Uh, here's a daily devotional book, checkbook of the Bank of Faith. Prayers of Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon's prayers, some that were taken down stenographically as he prayed at the Metropolitan Tabernacle during some public services. Here's one called Come Ye Children, which is a book written to help uh, advise people on training children. All of Grace is all-time best-selling book is all-time best-selling book. Uh, Moody, Spurgeon's books? Or? Moody Press published this as the first book Moody ever published. And they still have it in print. But of course, uh, many, many other companies have published this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd say that that's probably his all-time best-selling book, as mm -hmm. well as uh, one that uh, he's kind of known for. If there's one book above others that I'd say was a trademark book of Spurgeon. Mm -hmm. It would be this little book here, All of Grace, because I believe it has had a wider circulation. And then we have some individual sermons like in these little sizes here, Immutability of God, The Comforter, Infant Salvation. And we've just kind of <laughs> covered across the board to take advantage of every opportunity to get people acquainted with Spurgeon 
so that they could move on up to something bigger and deeper and broader in the uh, literature that he has available. And of course, in the ministerial level of study, those who are preachers and Bible teachers and conference speakers and mm -hmm. even those who have a deep interest in just study, uh, the sermon set is deeply appreciated and greatly valued. Uh, I have testimonies from all over the world, from well-known ministers of, well, all denominations, mm -hmm. uh, even so the So Spurgeon transcends the denominational even, barriers. Even, right. Even the gentleman I debated in Austin a while back, Brother Bill Jackson, remember his comments about Spurgeon? Right. He, he Church had, of Christ ministered at our viewers. He had positive things to say. Mm -hmm. about C.H. Spurgeon, and I donated a set of Spurgeon's commentary on the Book of Psalms to the school, mm -hmm. the Southwest School of Bible Studies, where mm -hmm. uh, Brother Jackson and now David Brown, of course, Mr. Brown was the head of that school and still is. But uh, at any rate, uh, Spurgeon has an appeal because of his committal to Christ and his committal to the Scriptures and his... I believe, personally, his being so under the leading and blessing of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't one going around here stomping platforms up and down telling about what a great anointing was upon him like some of our modern-day uh, ministers that want to brag about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think the more they talk about it, the less they manifest the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. because the Holy Spirit came not to testify of himself, as the scripture says, but he would glorify Christ. Right. So it's logical that the minister who glorifies Christ is the one who is really under the anointing mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. And, and the one who is glorifying the Holy Spirit and bragging about the Holy Spirit is the one who's probably far away from what that passage is talking about when it talks about the anointing and leading of the Holy Spirit. But Spurgeon, uh, he has a massive amount of materials and people that get involved in reading him, I don't think the word addicted would, be, would uh, imply the right concept, but uh, you just appreciate him mm -hmm. more than you might say your common writer or author uh, as compared to him, uh, you, you tend to measure others by Spurgeon. Mm -hmm. you, you read a Spurgeon sermon and then you tend to measure others by him, which is quite unfair. But, but at the same time, it's something that we, uh, I, I find people, they tend to do that. They say, well, he's no Spurgeon, or that doesn't compare with Spurgeon. Well, who can? Yeah, he was called the prince of pre preachers you know, I've, for the I've, 19th I've century. Had, I've had people say to me, they say, well, you're no Spurgeon. Well, who is, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so maybe that's a fault of ours by comparing things to Spurgeon. But once people start reading him and getting a grasp of the way he, and he's been dead 100 years now to 1892 to 1992, and yet, his material is just as much alive as your morning newspaper, in, in a sense. Right. Uh, you, you just have that much interest in him. Now, at this point, Bob, I need to, to kind of break in here because you preached a sermon uh, at Christ Memorial Baptist Church on the topic of Spurgeon and how he glorified Christ and how the Holy Spirit converted people marvelously to the son. And uh, I thought it was a wonderful sermon. I was in tears myself a few times in there. And I think at this moment we'll break and let our viewers see that sermon on Spurgeon and the wonderful conversions. That I, took I place. do want to make one correction. I noticed in watching the rerun on that that I made a mistake in a reference to one of my British brethren. I used mm -hmm. the name of Sidlo Baxter. Mm -hmm. I should have been using Herbert Lockyer the okay. author of the books that uh -huh. I refer to, but I knew both those men, and they're both from Britain, and they're both admirers of Spurgeon, and, and I just got that jumbled in my mind. Okay. And, uh, but whenever they hear the name Baxter, it should have been Herbert Lockyer. 
Uh, I, I don't think any, anybody will hold that against you there, Bob. <laughs> I hope not. All right, so with uh, that said, we will go now to Bob preaching a sermon about the life of Spurgeon and his glorification of Christ. Open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, and verse 22. I count it a privilege to be here on this occasion this evening and this morning to have the opportunity to present to this school, is that me? The opportunity to present to this church and this school the uh, sermons and books concerning C.H. Spurgeon, the sermons and books by him, as well as the histories and biography, biographical material that relates to him. It's uh, a peculiar blessing to me, which none of you would understand, I'm sure, just to be in the position to say to Brother Bullock and to this school, here, I want you to have these books, to be able to have those books here to present to you is a peculiar blessing to me. About 100 years after Spurgeon began preaching in London, I was converted. Spurgeon started preaching in London about 1854-55, uh, and I was actually converted in 1953. But about equal to the time that he started preaching in London, I stumbled across in the providence of God Spurgeon's book, some of his books. I was born and raised in West Tennessee. I was converted in Jackson, Tennessee. And lo and behold, in the public library of Jackson, Tennessee, I found some of Spurgeon's materials. And uh, to make a long story short, I've collected those books through the years, and in the providence of God, in 1955, in Chicago, I came across the majority of the set of books which I presented to Brother Bullock in the school today called the Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit. I was in an old bookstore in Chicago, about eight floors up in a downtown building. This man had uh, been in business there for years, collecting old religious books from around the world. It was called Blessing Bookstore, and it was indeed the beginning of a great blessing to me, because here my eyes fell upon this tremendous set of books by C.H. Spurgeon, which I'd never seen before, called the Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit, the printed sermons of Spurgeon beginning in 1855 up to his death in 1892 and continuing 25 years after his death till 1917. Now, we get that question a lot of times, Brother Bullock. How could Spurgeon preach from the dead? Well, I want to tell you, he was no Benny Hinn. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Bullock was telling me a while ago that Benny Hinn had gone out somewhere here to some of the bones of the prophets and laid down on them, and he's got a double blessing of power or something. I said, I'm not envious. <laughs> I'm not envious. But at any rate, Spurgeon had preached for years with stenographers taking down his sermons. Everywhere he preached, he had a stenographer there that was taking down what he was preaching. And uh, of course, he's like any other preacher. He preached several times a week, and they couldn't print all of his sermons. They printed one sermon every week consecutively from 1855 to 1917. And uh, so they had all this material. Some of his evening sermons, some of his weeknight sermons, some sermons he preached out at other places. So. Uh, after he died, the demand was still there, and they kept printing weekly sermons every week. At the end of the year, they'd put them in a bound book and issue the volume. So that's the story of why these sermons were coming out after he died. But, uh, you know, 
that's an amazing fact within itself that anybody would want to buy the sermons of a man that is already dead. It's hard enough to get people to go to church to listen to preachers, and then if uh, they publish a sermon, it's sometimes hard enough to get people to read it, and then to think that people still want it after they've been dead for so many years, it's even more amazing. But I know your pastor will tell you, not only as I will tell you, but as many others will tell you, once you start reading the sermons of Spurgeon or the writings of, Sermon, uh, the writings of Spurgeon and you catch on to that, you become addicted to it almost, and it's almost like a cultic addiction. And I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a Spurgeonite. He, he talked a while ago about me being, uh, having had debates with what we call the Camelites. You know, there's not a Camelite in this town. I've never, I've never met a Camelite in my life. Now, I'm, I'm serious about that. I've never met a man that'll come up to you and say, I'm a Camelite. Have you? Why? They're ashamed to admit that they adhere to the teachings of Alexander Campbell. And, and the first thing out of their mouth is going to be, I'm not a Campbellite. I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed to tell you, I'm a Spurgeonite. I am a Spurgeonite because what Spurgeon preached was the truth. And I can identify with uh, the doctrines and practices that Spurgeon preached. Why? Because I can find them right here in this book the Word of God. Now, I've, I've told people before, as far as being a Campbellite is concerned, I said, I, you know, I, I wouldn't attempt to defend him. You can't raise the dead, and so there's no need of trying to defend Alexander Campbell. But when it comes to Spurgeon, it's another story. The man preached the Word of God, and to be a Spurgeonite is to be one who believed the word of, who believes the Word of God. So I'm not ashamed to be called by that term if someone wants to Say that, I, I plead guilty. I have a bookstore in Pasadena, and some time ago we had a couple of young men come into the store, and uh, they were Spanish-speaking fellows primarily, and they were wanting to start a ministry among the Spanish-speaking people down in South Houston, and they were wanting to have me to give them some help along that line. And uh, I said, well, I would like to do this, and I would like to get some of the materials by Spurgeon into your hands that are in Spanish to give to the folks that you'll be ministering to. And they said, who's Spurgeon? I said, you don't know who Spurgeon is? Both these men were very young, in their early 20s, I suppose. And uh, being in that situation, I could understand that at that point in their lives, they had perhaps not heard of Spurgeon and knew anything about him. I said, you've never heard of Spurgeon? They said, no. And with all the seriousness I could get on my face without cracking a smile, I said, Spurgeon was the 13th apostle. <laughs> and they looked at one another. They didn't know whether to jump, jump and leave or uh, laugh or what. And I said, come back here and let me show you Spurgeon. So I went back to this little corner of my bookstore where we have this picture of Spurgeon that we go back to three times a day and bow down and pray <laughs> and, and all. Now, we have all his books on display back at this particular section. It's about an eight-foot wide section, and all of his books and sermons and so forth that we publish and some other publishers. By the way, Brother Bullock mentioned other publishers. There's about 12 or 15 companies, I suppose, in the world that publish something by Spurgeon. And uh, Zondervan, the largest company in the United States for years, they published Morning and Evening, his devotional book. And they've published that for, I don't know, 40 or 50 years or more. Baker Bookhouse in Grand Rapids, Kriegel in Grand Rapids, and Erdman's in Grand Rapids, all of them have something of Spurgeon. How many of you have heard of Moody Bible Institute and Moody Press and uh, D.L. Moody? And uh, You know the first book that D.L. Moody ever printed? It was Spurgeon's book entitled All of Grace. All of Grace. And you know the book that has sold more books in the history of Moody Publishing Company, Moody Press, than any other book? Spurgeon's book, All of Grace. And they still print it today. We print it today, and there's two or three other companies that print it today. 
Now, and, and I'm telling you this just to emphasize that there are publishers and companies around the world that still publish Spurgeon. Child evangelism. I'm sure all of you have heard of child evangelism, an organization that was started to work with children by a man by the name of Oberholzer. You know why it got started? Oberholzer was reading a sermon by Spurgeon, and uh, Spurgeon sat in there, the child is three or four years old, could be saved by hearing the gospel and having the gospel expounded to that child. And Overholzer said, I just can't believe this. So he said, I'm going to try it. And he went out and started witnessing to children, and he found out that children could be converted by the power of the gospel. And he started working with them, and lo and behold, he had to give up his pastorate and go into this child evangelism ministry that's on the scene today, reaching children around the world. Who, where'd he get this idea? Reading a sermon by C.H. Spurgeon. Talking about Moody, before Moody ever started to preach, he was a Sunday school teacher, working with people in Sunday school. He heard about Spurgeon over in London preaching to the largest Baptist church in England. This was back in the 1860s. Moody said, I want to go hear him preach. He went across the ocean. He went to the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And unlike the Christ Memorial Baptist Church or most other Baptist churches in this town, he couldn't get in. He didn't have a ticket. Can you imagine having to have a ticket to get in to hear a preacher like Brother Bullock here? <laughs> Anyway, the problem was Spurgeon only had a bill and it would seat about 5,000. And uh, Sunday morning services, they were packed out and, and uh, people were turned away. And so what they did, they said, we'll start passing out tickets so that everyone who plans to come Sunday morning will be sure of having a seat. And then if you can't come, you can give your ticket to someone else that wants to come. And so uh, you showed up there Sunday morning without a ticket while well, you were just out of luck unless there was somebody out out front, uh, what do they call these fellows stand out front selling tickets? Yeah. Scalpers. <laughs> and uh, so unless you got hold of someone out there that was scalping tickets to hear a Baptist preacher, which is kind of unheard of, isn't it? But anyway, Moody said, I found out I couldn't get in without a ticket, but he said uh, somehow I got in. He sneaked in. Here's a preacher or a Sunday school teacher sneaking in without a ticket to hear, hear another preacher. So he went in there and he sat down in this seat and he said, I'd like to take this seat back to America with me. He was there, this was said on a later occasion when he was there speaking at a memorial service for Spurgeon. He said, I remember the very seat and I'd like to take it back to America with me. But Moody went over there, he listened to Spurgeon and he saw Spurgeon's school for preachers and he saw the publishing work that Spurgeon was doing, publishing literature, and Moody said, I, by the grace of God, want to do this same thing in America. So he came back to America. Soon he started preaching. He went into evangelism. And as time went on, he established a school founded on the same pattern as the one that Spurgeon had in London started a publishing ministry founded on the same pattern Spurgeon had in London. And uh, lo and behold, the Moody Bible Institute has become somewhat an example for schools like Brother Bullock has started here, like others have started all over this country, the Bible Institute, Bible College movement. And the inspiration of that goes back to C.H. Spurgeon in London and his ministry of the Pastors College that he had over there. He was the first one in the English-speaking world to have that concept of training preachers on the level that uh, they would not be studying to become great scholars and, and uh, you know, just those doctors and all this that we have when you go off to some of these seminaries and come back to pastor some of these big churches where you have to have five degrees hanging after your name. Uh, that's another thing about Spurgeon. <clears throat> he had a degree, all right. He had a B.A. degree. He was born again. He was born again. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, really. I, I got all off base here with 
this in the beginning, but anyway, that, that lets you know a little bit about when Spurgeon lived, what he did, who he was, and what does he have to do with us today? I believe, based on what I've studied in the Baptist history, and Brother Bullock can correct me on this if I'm wrong or someone else who knows more about it, but based on my study of Baptist history for the last hundred years at least, 150 years at least, there's no man in the world, living or dead, who has had a greater influence and continues to have a greater influence upon the Baptist of America than C.H. Spurgeon. And if you don't believe that, if you don't agree with that, then I would challenge you to study the facts, study the details, study the influences that have been brought to bear upon, me, upon people. I guess the most famous Baptist preacher in Texas at this point in time for the last 30 or 40 years, the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, W.A. Criswell. You know who he said had more influence on his ministry than anyone else? The sermons of C.A. Spurgeon. That's W.A. Criswell's testimony. The most influential fundamentalist Baptist preacher in America in the last hundred years of the strictly the fundamentalist Baptist probably was J. Frank Norris, who was pastor in Fort Worth, Texas, and one of the founders of the World Baptist Fellowship. And you know who J. Frank Norris said had more influence upon his ministry than any man in the world is C.H. Spurgeon. And you could just go all over from place to place. Some of you have read books probably by a man named uh, Sidlow Baxter, an Englishman. He wrote a series of books, All the Women of the Bible, All the Men of the Bible, All the Miracles of the Bible. How many have read anything but Baxter? Oh, hands going up everywhere. You all know who I'm talking about. He came by our booth one year at the Booksellers Convention, and I forget what city this was in, but he came by our booth. He was an old man at that time. He was in a wheelchair. Someone was pushing him around. And he looked up and he saw the picture of Spurgeon we had on display, and he stopped. He said, I owe my ministry to this man. He said, here's my testimony. He said, I was converted under a deacon who was a member of Spurgeon's church. His name was Olney, Deacon Olney. He came to my hometown when I was about five or six years old and he preached the gospel and I was converted. And he said, this man was a convert of C.H. Spurgeon and was a deacon in Spurgeon's church and was out doing the ministry from that church at that time. And he said, if it weren't for the ministry of C.H. Spurgeon, I would have had no ministry. This is a man living in this generation. I'm talking about 10 or 15 years ago when he told me this. J. Sidlow Baxter. And these kind of stories I could stand here and tell you all night, but uh, I asked Brother Bullock how much time I had, and he said, all you want, and I kind of laughed <laughs> because uh, this is a subject that I just don't wear out on, talking about Spurgeon and the ministry he had for the Lord. On the back of every one of Spurgeon's books, and you'll see it when you look at these books in the library, we have a symbol. We have an emblem. It's not a cross. It's not a dove. It's not uh, some image that man dreamed up. It says, it's a little oval-shaped thing there, and in it, it's the image of uh, Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. And around that little thing it says, we preach Christ and him crucified. Some time ago in my bookstore I had a young man who was kind of mocking the idea that Spurgeon was such a great preacher. He said, what is it about Spurgeon that's so great? I said, one thing my friend, he preached Jesus Christ and him crucified all the way through his sermons. I said, I challenge you to take down a book and let it fall open 
at any place. And I challenge you not to find Jesus Christ and him crucified on that page. He kind of laughed. He went and got a book. He tried it two or three times and he couldn't do it because he found Spurgeon preaching Christ on every page. Now that text I read to you, or rather I uh, directed you to, are you still there? Isaiah 45, 22. This was the passage that God used to call C.H. Spurgeon. Brother Bullock preached this morning on a text that referred to being called. Romans chapter 8, verses uh, 28, 29, 30, referring to calling according to God's purpose. God calls Spurgeon through this text right here, Isaiah 45, 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Now, God's not going to save all the ends of the earth. That's not what this passage is talking about. He's simply saying that all the ends of the earth, wherever anyone is going to be saved, or wants to be saved, or salvation is going to be experienced, it's going to be by looking to me. Look unto me, all the ends of the earth, from China on the far east to California on the west, wherever, North Pole, South Pole, all the way back to the beginning of Adam, all the way down to the last one that will be saved in the future. Look unto me, all ye ends all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else we're going to have to look to Jesus Christ God in the flesh for salvation now Spurgeon was about 15 years old and although he was a very brilliant youngster and although his father had been a preacher and his grandfather had been a preacher and his mother was a very godly person Spurgeon, at that time, although he knew a lot of the scriptures and uh, was a very conscientious type boy, he was not converted and he was very much concerned about this. He was under conviction, as we might say. And he wanted to be saved. Now, I'll tell you how desirous he was to be saved. Now, it's not that you have to be this earnest about it. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that you have to go through a certain experience. We never want to exalt any man's experience because men have different experiences. If we had to, if we had to copy somebody's experience, why, we'd have a hard time being saved like the thief on the cross, wouldn't we? <laughs> we'd, ha we'd have a hard time being saved like the Apostle Paul, wouldn't we? We'd have a hard time being saved like some of these people that we read about in the Word of God there are different experiences, and you don't want to go to try to copy someone else's experiences. You can learn the principles, however. Now, Spurgeon was earnest with God. Spurgeon was seeking God. Spurgeon was wanting to hear the Word of God, and he was wanting the forgiveness of God. So one day he got up, he said, I'm going to go, and I'm going to find the, the Word of God. I'm going to know the gospel, I'm going to get this message, and I'm going, to, I'm going to get saved. That was the earnestness of his heart. He said he determined that he was going to go to every church in town or in his vicinity till he could get peace with God. He was going to give them all a chance to convert him. Well, he set out for church, and the one he was going to was not the one God wanted him to go to. And God sent a snowstorm, Spurgeon said. It was snowing so heavy that he couldn't even see where he was going. And so he turned down a little side street, and at the end of that street, there was a little old church named the Primitive Methodist Church. Here he was setting out to hear Dr. So-and-so at some place, and God turned him down a little old street, a little church down there, Primitive Methodist Church. Well, he went in, the preacher wasn't even there. 
preacher had been snowed out. He couldn't even get to church that day. And Spurgeon said there was about 10 or 12 people there. And uh, so he took his seat way back in the back. Uh, probably the building was about one-third as big as this and about one-half of the seats. I've seen pictures of it. It's still there, by the way, over in England. So he took his seat in the back under the little balcony that they had back there. Well, he said after a while, one old man got up to preach, and he said he looked like he might be a carpenter or something like that, you know, just a common man. And he said he read a text, Isaiah 45, 22, and he said he said a few words about it, two or three, four, five minutes, and he said after that he was at the end of his tether. He didn't have anything else to say. And he said he looked back at me. And he said, young man, you look miserable. And Spurgeon said, well, he said, I suppose I did because I was miserable, but I'd never had anybody tell me from the pulpit before that I looked miserable. Not common for a preacher to stand up there and point out and say, hey, you look miserable. <laughs> he said, young man, you'll never get rid of that misery until you look to Jesus. He said, young man, look, look, look. And Spurgeon said, lo and behold, I did look. And he said, I felt the burden fall away. And he said, I went out of that place rejoicing in God, rejoicing in my sins forgiven. And he said, that snow that I saw reminded me of that scripture about your sins being washed white as snow. He went away, a child of God. He looked to Jesus Christ. His sins were forgiven. He found what he was looking for in the most unlikely place in all the world. He thought he was going down to find it at some church maybe, but God said, I'm going to send you down here <laughs> and show you something that you know, God moves in mysterious ways, we've heard it said, his wonders to perform. This was how Spurgeon was found by God. Spurgeon didn't find the Lord. The Lord found Spurgeon. You see, we're so busy trying to get men to find God that we don't want God to find them. We want the glory for us finding men rather than God finding them. I had a friend just died here lately, one of my golfing buddies that I'd played golf with, and I had been on the golf cart with him the last time I played golf, and then I came to Austin. This was in July. I left on Friday, and I came to Austin. He died Saturday, and I was still here in Austin. I went home Sunday, and there it was in the newspaper. He's dead. I said, I just played golf with him on Thursday. And he was a world's heavyweight boxer. Any of you ever hear of Floyd Patterson? This man fought Floyd Patterson for the world's heavyweight champion, championship. He got knocked out in two or three rounds. But he said, I got $150,000. <laughs> but he was ranked number seven in the world by Ring Magazine when he was a boxer. Anyway, I went to the funeral. And there was a Baptist church down there, and I'm not saying this to criticize the brethren, but they had a little brochure there, and one of the pictures in there was a picture of this gentleman. His name was Todd, Todd Heron. And they had in there this church, by its outreach, had reached this man. I thought, no, friend, you're wrong. <coughs> it's not you that reached this man. You could have never done it. Under Todd's name, it said he was the meanest man in Houston, and he was. <laughs> I mean, he had a reputation on a certain street in Houston that he was the meanest man on that street. And if the cops went after him to arrest him, they took two or three with them because he was a tough one. But 
This church couldn't have reached Todd. He was too hard. He was too difficult. But God did reach him. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't use us. I'm not saying that God doesn't use the preacher. I'm not saying that God doesn't use the witness, that God doesn't use the track distributor and your testimony. God does, just like he used that old carpenter or whoever it was standing up there preaching the Spurgeon that night. But when you start talking about who did the reaching, who did the finding, my friends, this message that your pastor preaches, that I preach or that anyone else is preaching, it'll just roll off that man's back like water off a duck's back if God doesn't have anything to do with it. Right. He's got to convict. He's got to prick. He's got to make it effectual. And that's what happened to Spurgeon. But you know, Brother Bullock, Spurgeon said, now this was when he was 15 years old. And of course he went on, and as time went on, he became a famous preacher. Hello? You Mr. Spurgeon? I'm the preacher that preached that time over there when you got saved. Oh yeah? Well, I don't recognize you. Go on your way. Here's another one come up. I'm the preacher that preached over there that time you got saved. Imposters come along, Brother Bullock, trying to get the glory for Spurgeon's conversion. And you know, Spurgeon said, I never did find out who that man was that God used to convert me, that God used to speak to me that message there. I never did find out who it was. But he said, I've had many people come up to me and try to tell me they were the ones that preached to me when I was saved. Isn't that just like vain man wanting the glory? Wanting the glory for something God did? Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. My friends, if you're going to be saved, you've got to look to him, get your eyes off the preacher. There are people today who actually want to be known as having been converted under a certain preacher. I'm a convert of Dr. So-and-so down here. As if that is important. As if that's going to put a feather in their cap. The vain glory of man. Let's give God the glory. Look unto me, be ye saved all the ends of the earth. I'm God and there's none else. While I'm a great admirer of Spurgeon, my friends, let me say this, that he is not my Savior. He's not your Savior. He's not anyone else's Savior, and he never claimed to be a Savior. But let me tell you this about him. He magnified the one who is the Savior, and he did it in such a way that there are thousands of people rise up in the judgment day or the day of reward or whatever it is when God calls this whole thing off to a conclusion, there'll be thousands rise up and bless the name of Spurgeon in the same voice that they say, praise God for Jesus Christ, that he sent the voice of Spurgeon to preach to me about him. When they built the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, it was the largest church in the world. I'm going to come to a conclusion here. It was the largest Baptist church in the world. And Spurgeon was going around checking out the acoustics. Now, they didn't have these little gadgets, microphones. They didn't have these little gadgets, microphones. They didn't have the systems that we have today to pick up the voice, to carry it to you. They had to construct the buildings with the acoustics in mind and the way the building was constructed, they had learned somehow how to carry that voice out to the rest of the building that you would be uttering up here. I was in Mexico one time. I guess a lot of y'all have been down the same place. There's a place down there in one of the old ruins. You can go over and stand in a corner and whisper, and somebody way over here on the other side can hear it. It's amazing. Well, Spurgeon was testing the acoustics. He thought he was the only person in the building. So he got up and stood in the pulpit, and he quoted John chapter 1, verse 29. 
Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And he thought, that sounds pretty good. That's all right. So he went on and days passed, weeks passed, and here comes a visitor to Spurgeon. He said, I want to join your church. I've, I'm a child of God. I've been converted. He said, well, when were you converted? He said, I was working in the Metropolitan Tabernacle one day and you were in there checking the acoustics and you quoted the scripture, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And he said, God took that thing to my heart and I've been under conviction and I finally yielded to the Lord and I'm saved. Here was a man that was just quoting a scripture to check the acoustics and here was a man that he didn't even know was in the building and God takes it like, what's that saying in the Old Testament about an arrow at a, a venture, a bow at a venture? He shot that arrow, it landed in this man's heart. And I remember years ago hearing Slater Murphy, a well-known Baptist preacher out of Memphis, tell how he was converted. He said he was on a street, uh, on an old-fashioned country town and up there, and, and he was hearing, he heard a preacher preaching on Court Square. He said, I was ashamed to go down there and listen to him. He said, I didn't want anybody to think I'd go down and listen to a, a preacher preaching on a Court Square. He said, I slid into a little old uh, alley there, and I listened. And he said that preacher was quoting Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23. Uh, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he said, I heard those verses, and he said, I have never in my life been so convicted by some scripture as I was on that occasion. And he said, I wouldn't dare go out and listen to that preacher, but he said, God took it to my heart, and I could not get away from it, and he said, it led to me being saved. What does that say to us? My word shall not return unto me void, it shall accomplish that whereunto I have sent it. Brother Bullock was talking today about purpose, and he mentioned the free will and, and such and all. I, I was talking to him after the service today, and I said, you know, rather than say free will, it's self-will that people are really talking about. When they talk about, oh, it's the will of man, it's the free will of man, they're actually saying it's a self-will, that you're the one that's doing the saving. I've heard people, they'll stand up and they'll try to defend self-will with their mouth, and contend for what they call free will, and then they'll get down and they'll pray, Lord, have your will. They'll pray the very opposite of what they get up and try to defend with their head. I tell you what, and this is going to be my final, final, final. Let me tell you this. I don't know anything in my life that I want to have the control of in contrast to God having the control of it. Do you? Is there anything in your life that you want to be in charge of that if God will take control of, you won't let him take control of it? I don't, I don't know anything in my life I want the Lord, I, I would have him to take control of my mind and my heart and my body and my soul because I know that he can do a better job with it than I can. And if you've got so little sense and so little faith that you want to have self-will or free will or whatever you want to call it, rather than to have God dominating and controlling and ruling you, my friends, I think you're just taking the fool's route. And there are those here tonight, probably not saved. You don't know anything about Spurgeon. You don't know anything about Jesus. You don't know anything about salvation. But let me tell you, you surrender your heart. You surrender your soul. You surrender yourself to the sovereign will of God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You just 
as Spurgeon did, look unto him. Now, that's what that means when it says look. It means you quit looking to yourself. You look to him for salvation. And you'll find the joy of the Lord. You'll find the forgiveness of sins. And you'll find the life that's worth living under his grace, under his leadership, in the power of his spirit. Brother Bullock, I'll turn the service back to you. Let's stand together, please. Folks, that is the gospel. Look unto me. And as he said, we certainly do not look unto a Spurgeon or to a Moody or to a Pastor Bullock or a Pastor Weaver or a Pastor whoever. We look unto him. And if you're here tonight and you're in need of salvation, you're not going to get saved unless you look unto Jesus. He died for, you, for us 2,000 years ago, and he shed his blood to pay a debt that he didn't owe, and he was buried and he arose from the dead. And if you will look unto him through the eyes of faith, he'll save you. I hope that you parents and you people will get to the works of Spurgeon's in the lives of your children and in your own life because they are very, very good. There is so much garbage on the bookshelves of our country today. He mentioned Benny Hinn a little while ago. I'm so fed up to hear with the baloney that he puts out nine holy spirits or nine parts of nine persons of the trinity is what he was preaching that's pure pure garbage he said the other day that he was in a room and michael the archangel with a belt buckle appeared to him <laughs> with m on it <laughs> and bob said that could have been maroney that was the one that appeared to joseph smith might not have been michael and folks, people are swallowing all those, below, those lies everywhere. And we're, all we're hearing today, is we're reading is fetish books about this and about that. These books will help you grow in the Lord. And I hope you'll get your hands on it and uh, use them for your glory. Let's bow together. If there be anybody here tonight. You... Well, I thought that was a rather outstanding sermon myself. I hope you enjoyed it. It shows you how the power of God works through men of God to lead sinners to repentance and a coming to, the, to Christ. Uh, I don't know, something about testimonials and, 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 and con the mighty conversions uh, just kind of chokes me up, Bob, and, and that sermon was a great one for, for showing people the power of, I guess, the, the foolishness of preaching that God has chosen as his method to bring people unto himself. Well, thanks for your comment about the sermon, and I'd like to say to our listeners that we have a lot of free copies of Spurgeon's sermons themselves. Yes, uh, could you hold those up available. to the camera here? And uh, If the camera can get in I, on this. Uh, uh, just several samples of sermons here. I'm just Those are free to the viewers if they'd right. like to call. Individual call copies, them. and if they'll just call or write to us at Pilgrim Publications, Pasadena, Texas, 77501, mm -hmm. we'll be glad to send them free literature about Spurgeon and a price list and catalog of the materials we have. Right, and uh, just to show our viewers also that you have a free catalog of all the listed books and things available, including even an index. Of uh, that, that has all the titles and all the text of Spurgeon's sermons for all those years, those 63 volumes of sermons. Every year. Incredible. Well, brother, we're just about out of time for this show. Uh, I want to thank our viewers for joining us today. Uh, if you have a chance, call the number or write us and get hold of some of Spurgeon's works. Uh, I think you'll find that he preaches Christ and him crucified. And the glorification of Jesus Christ is always our goal. Thank you for being with us. This is Larry Wessels and Bob L. Ross for Pilgrim Publications Presents. God bless. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com, 
This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available.